What's up guys and welcome back to Monique. If you guys are new here, then what is up? My name is Erica. Hiya, how you doing? If you're into the history of the ancient Greeks and the Romans, maybe you're just into the mythology and maybe, maybe you just miss Juno really screwing with Aeneas and you need a little bit more of that drama in your life. Well, then this is not only the video for you, this is also the channel for you. You guys are gonna wanna hit that subscribe button and the bell icon so you know every single time I post in the future. But on topic of today's video, and as you can see from the title, we're gonna be diving into book seven of Virgil's Aeneid. If I could summarize book seven into a one sentence, it would just be that Juno Juno and Electo team up to start a war in Latium. Yes, we now have a two goddess team that now decide to make Aeneas' life a living hell. Are we surprised by this? We honestly shouldn't be. It was about time that Juno came back and decided to just ruin Aeneas' life. And that is exactly what we get in this book. So with that being said, why don't we just make all of that make a little bit more sense and dive into the narrative. So the book opens, as we left you last time, Aeneas is now in the boat and he's steering the boat and they are now trying to get to where Latium is. And so there's a very long description of sort of like they start at one point they get back on the boat and then they were supposed to go to Cersei's island but Neptune was like oh no because remember how he promised Venus that he would make sure that the boat was safe and so he steers them away from that they basically very very long intro short they end up where they should be near the, the, the Tiber River. I don't know why I struggled over that, but near the Tiber River. Um, so when Aeneas sees this and he sees the river going inland, he tells his men now to get ready to get off the boat and they're going to start settling there. Virgil evokes a muse. He tries to evoke a muse right now and he says, I'm gonna need you in a heart second because we're gonna tell this whole story and we're gonna tell the story of the Latins and how they came and their peoples and who they are. I am going to be missing all of that out in this video because I'm far too lazy to go into the history of Latium. I don't give a sh that much to be quite honest and I don't think it's that necessary for the summary as somebody who studied that um, but you can go and obviously it's it's all in the book if you need those specific parts but Virgil evokes muse he's like help me he tells us Latinus who's the king his whole backstory his whole family backstory basically to tell us that uh, there are prophetic roots in him okay so his dad had like this gift of prophecy and all of this and so in the middle of his house where he, where he lives where Latinus lives in the middle of the house there's a courtyard and in the middle of the courtyard there's a laurel tree and and at one point, this is before Aeneas comes, at one point uh, they go into the courtyard and they see this like swarm of bees around the laurel tree. And they're sort of fighting and they're just sort of, you know, like flying around crazily and all of this. And uh, then eventually they calm down and they all settle on the top of the tree. So obviously because the ancients are super superstitious, uh, they were just looking at this going, what the f*** does that mean? They get somebody to interpret it and they interpreted that what that means that there's going to be an army coming, there's going to be lots of fighting and then eventually they're going to take over and they are going to uh, to rule over the land, that that is what that B sign means, apparently. And so Latinus wants confirmation of this and he goes to the prophetic oracle of his dad and he asks the question of what that means and what he should do uh, in the future, given this little portent that he's been given. And so his dad comes to him in a dream and he's like, Latinus, you should not marry your daughter to a Latin. She's going to marry a stranger. And he basically tells him of Aeneas without actually saying, Aeneas is coming. Don't worry, when he comes, he's going to be a really nice guy. Doesn't say that, he just says that the foreign guy is going to come and that is who your daughter has to marry because she's then going to be part of this very important race to come in generations and generations so you will then be part of that and so therefore you need to abandon all the ideas of your daughter marrying a latin and uh marrying the safe option basically in the land he just says get rid of that now latinus being the gossip that he is he goes back he does not keep it a secret and he tells everybody what he's been told by his dad in a dream from the oracle and, and all of this he tells everybody what's happened and it means that rumor as we've met before rumor picks up this and rumor's like i'm gonna tell everybody so rumor tells everybody in the surrounding area what latinus has been told not not everybody is a fan of this because basically everybody wants to marry Lavinia, his daughter. Anywho, we hear the rumor has started in the Latin kingdom, but then the narrative cuts back to Aeneas and Aeneas and his men are now on the banks of the river and they are feasting, right? They're super hungry. They're eating like everything in sight. And Ascanius at one point just randomly as a joke says as they're all eating, look at us, we're so hungry, we're eating our tables. Now this sounds like a really benign sentence, but it, not to Aeneas, okay? Aeneas takes this and he's just like, holy I can't believe that you said that. Apparently, Anchises had told him at one point or the other that when the men start eating their tables, quote unquote, that that is going to be the spot for the first part of the foundations of his future city. And so Aeneas is super excited about this. He's like, clear away all the food, clear away all the tables. We're gonna start right now in building the foundations of at least one house because this is the land, according to my dad, this is the land that we are supposed to settle on. So they pour out all of these libations to various gods, to nymphs, to all of this sort of stuff, you know, to get permission basically uh, from the divine to start building on this land. And through these, they also make offerings to Jupiter and Jupiter makes himself known that he's heard this and that he gives permission for them to start building by letting out like three caps of thunder 
Wonder and all of this. And so all of them are just like, hell yeah, we're in the right spot. The next day, Aeneas decides that he's going to start building, but he's going to send a bunch of his Trojans to King Latinus to go and basically inform him that they're there and that they would like to, you know, meet him and that they want to to basically do this in the nicest way possible because Aeneas knows, okay, now we're here. I've kind of got to take over. He doesn't want to just come in like swords ablaze and any of this stuff. So he says, you guys go ahead and talk to Latinus. You guys let him know that we're here and bring all of these gifts that Andromache had given me when we had done that stop ages ago. Bring all of those gifts um, to him so that that way, you know, he knows that we basically, we come in peace, okay? Aeneas meanwhile starts building the walls and the men, about a hundred of them, start walking towards Latinus's palace to go and say hi. When the men start approaching the city, there are lots of young men and older men outside and they're exercising and among them is basically one of the messengers or one of the heralds for Latinus. And so he sees this crazy amount of people walking towards them and he's like, ah, uh, what the f So he goes to Latinus and he says probably like my favorite line on like a funny level, not an important line, but he says to them, yo Latinus, um, outside, I just saw these guys, they're wearing really fucking funny costumes, should I let them in? And it's the funny costumes part that I'm always like, the fact he's like, their clothes are really fucking weird, are you sure you want me to let them in? It's just such like a funny moment that I'm like, yeah, I mean, I probably would have relayed the message the same way. Latinus obviously says yes, Latinus is like, of course you're gonna let them in, these are probably the people that I've been spoken to about, been spoken to about, yeah, that does make sense. And so he's like, these are probably the people that I've heard about, absolutely, let them in, I'm gonna take my seat on my throne in this whole like temple thing and let them in because I want to speak to them. Then, because it's Virgil, there is a very long description of exactly where Latinus is sitting and what the meaning of where he's sitting is. Because Virgil never likes to take that away from us. He thinks that we want to know every single fucking detail. And let me tell you, sometimes we don't. This is one of those instances, uh, we don't need to know it. But we get it all. And the Trojans appear, the Trojans come in front of him. And before they can say anything, that Latinus asks them who they are, where they're from, what brings them there, you know, all of the regular questions that we are used to. And he also says to them, don't refuse my guest friendship, even if you are driven off course by some sort of storm, I don't know how you got here, but I want to be a guest friend of you guys. So please come and stay, you know, you're more than welcome here. We want to hear all of your stories. And this is this is our way, this is our ancient way. This is our way of respecting you guys and respecting um, guests who come to our city. He also recounts how, because he knows that there are Trojans in front of him, he also recounts how he is aware that Dardanus, one of their founders came from this land. So he's like, we're basically all brothers. And all the Trojans are like thrilled to hear this. A guy by this name speaks and he basically says, yes, we are Trojan and we have a lot to offer. You know what? Lots of people want to be allies with us. We're just here to say that to you. That basically we're now offering our allyship. We don't do this all the time. So this is really a top notch offer. We've been told that this is the land that we're supposed to come back to by the gods, by fate, by destiny, by King Aeneas. It was not some storm that led us here that King Aeneas did. And he is here to help you. He wants to come and help because of fate, because of destiny and all these things driving him here. So please take our allyship. We have all of these gifts from, from past Troy that we have brought with us. And he describes the things that um, Andromache again gave them in order to, to give to King Latinus. Or, well, she didn't really know it was gonna be King Latinus. She just knew it was gonna be the future site of Troy. And so, uh, so she gives it to them and now they're giving it to Latinus. Latinus of course says yes. He says, of course, I'm gonna receive your gift. This is great. However, one thing, can Aeneas come and talk to me? If he wants to come and he wants to, if he's the king, if he wants to rule with me or whatever his little plan is, if he wants to take over from me, if he wants to marry my daughter, he's got to come and say hi at the very least. Like this is something that I think is really weird that Aeneas does, that like, he doesn't go to Latinus himself. He sends people to go in front of him as if he's like too important. Like we don't see that from Odysseus at any point in the Odyssey. Like he always goes to say hi and he always uh, make sure that he is known to whoever, you know, the land, that whoever rules the land even. Whereas Aeneas is down building a fucking wall at this point and he's got some other people to do his dirty work. So Latinus says, bring Aeneas here. I would love to have him here. And I've been told that there will be a foreign guy who comes in and that he's going to marry my daughter and I'm supposed to, that our fate, that our destiny is aligned with this story that you're telling. So therefore I would love to meet him please tell him to come back here. He then gives the Trojans a bunch of horses to ride back down as like a peace offering. You know, they give some gold, he gives some horses. They then ride back down to Aeneas on the beach on these gleaming, beautiful horses. And again, we get a really long description about how nice these horses are. As Aeneas's men are riding down back to the beach to go and tell Aeneas the good news of how their allyship is going swimmingly well, that is when Juno enters the picture because Juno is coming back from Argos, as we know from the Iliad. This is one of her favorite cities, which as I said then, and 
I will say every single time, I don't know how much she likes it because she did offer it on a silver platter to Jupiter. Well, to Zeus in that book, but because we're in Rome, Jupiter. She offers it onto a silver platter to Jupiter and says, yeah, these are cities that I like. And if you ever want to destroy one, he is one of the ones that you can choose from. So I, I don't know based off of that if she really loves it that much that she's willing to be like, destroy it, it's fine. Anywho, she's coming back from Argos and she's sort of running around the bottom of Sicily and she realizes she can sense and then she can see Aeneas is not miserable, right? He's actually in the right place. He's having a good time. And she flips unsurprisingly. She is so pissed off by this beyond what we've seen before. In fact, she has a little hissy fit in this moment, which is one of my favorite judo hissy fits in the entire world. She just stands there and she goes, what the f do I have to do to these Trojans for them to just accept death? The city of Troy literally burned and they refused to burn with it. What else am I supposed to do? It's well funny. She starts to doubt herself as a goddess because she can't seem to kill these people. But this is the moment where she realizes that she's probably never gonna be able to kill these people. That she's just like, look, even though I'm a goddess, I'm gonna go down to hell faster than I'm going to kill the Trojans, clearly. So because of that, I'm gonna stop trying to kill them. And instead, I'm just gonna try and make their life a living hell. Like this is her moment of acceptance and her moment of acceptance is basically deciding that she's going to cause the war in Latium. She is going to be the person to really put this in motion. And so she has this monologue where she's talking about this all out loud and she's saying, you know, like that Aeneas must have to marry Lavinia, that's fine, but it's gonna come at a cost and that Lavinia's dowry is going to be the blood of the Rutilians. That is the very ominous last line that she gives us. But Juno can't do this alone. She's not a one man band, okay? So she goes down to Electo, who's one of the Furies. Now the Furies are terrifying creatures, okay? They are terrifying throughout all of mythology. And this is what, like, like Greek and Roman, by the way. So they're terrifying all across the board. This is who she goes to right now in order to help her achieve this plan. She has a very simple task for Electo, which is just go and call because I want all of them to end up fighting. Whatever you have to do to make everybody angry at each other, to turn against each other, make it happen. Electo is thrilled by this. She knows exactly how to make everybody angry. She knows exactly how to make everybody pick up arms and how to want to fight each other, even, you know, young, old, whatever it is. This is what she does best. This is what she excels at. And so she whisks off. She whisks off down to the Latins and her first target is Amata. So Amata is the queen. She is queen to the king part of Latinus, right? So she's married to Latinus. And she, we find out, has always wanted her daughter Lavinia to marry Turnus. Now Turnus is a Latin. He is like the most incredible of the Latins. Lots of the Latins want to marry Lavinia, but Turnus is like top dog. He's super handsome. He's super great, super accomplished, great fighter, all of this sort of stuff. She has just been told, bear in mind by her husband, that now Lavinia will not marry Turnus because the gods have apparently told him um, not to do that, which Amata is already not very happy about. But Electo targets this and she knows that that's a weak point. So she goes down to the palace and she sits outside of the room where Amata is sitting in. And she takes out one of the uh, snakes from her hair because Furies have a lot of snakes everywhere. They're depicted constantly differently. Snake hair, snake belt, snake clothes, all the time, lots of snakes. And so she takes one of the snakes from her hair and she just like throws it basically at Amata when she's sitting down. And uh, the snake goes to her chest and it feeds on like, you know, her blood and all of this and puts her venom into it and all of this. So, so there's like the little exchange from her and this poisonous snake. And then it goes around her neck and sits at the necklace. So Amata, with all of this now pent up anger and a lot of like really godly infused anger in her, she tries to convince Latinus that he's basically fucking insane for not marrying off their daughter to Turnus and for waiting around for some random stranger to show about. She's not happy about this. Is she kind of living through Lavinia? Does she fancy Turnus herself and is trying to make her daughter marry Turnus because she can't because she's married to Latinus? I don't know. But either way, she's very gung-ho about Turnus, tries to convince Latinus. She says all the right things, even that she's like, well, if you want somebody who's foreign, technically Turnus is foreign because his roots are back in Mycenae. So he's Greek, which is great. So why don't we just marry her off to him? Because surely that still meets, doesn't that still meet the whole prophecy thing that you were told? Latinus is like, no. And so she's pissed. That is an understatement. She's pissed. She's infused by the god. She's got all this snake venom viper going on. The snake is like slithering in between her top and her dress and, and her skin and all of this sort of stuff. And she just goes into this frenzy. Amata goes into a frenzy where she's described as being like a back end. So she runs out of the palace. She's like screaming and hollering super mad and she's going through the town even the town of where they are she goes through the town she's screaming and she basically riles up with the help of electo obviously not knowing that the help of electo is there but she riles up all of the other latin mothers who might also 
uh, really identify with what she's going through, that they're not allowed to marry off their children to who they want their children to be married to, that it's all about who the husband wants. Rumor helps rally all of these mothers together and they all come out to meet a Martin and they all go into the forest and they all have basically this moment where they're screaming up to Bacchus and Virgil writes that they're like pretending to be like worshiping Bacchus, but it's not really pretending, I guess. Like, I guess pretending is a bad word for me to have used to, to translate that, that, that basically they are overwhelmed by a god, but they're just sort of then like, you know, rallying around being like, Bacchus, hear me, blah, blah, blah. And they're like screaming and all of this. And so they are left to do that in the forest. Basically the first hit was a success because it's just total mayhem for one person who was then yelling at her husband and then got all of the mothers in the town to also just descend into madness at the same time. This is a very interesting, <laughs> very interesting opening to Electo. And to Amata. Electo can see that her job is done with one character. She's like fucking brilliant. So then she fucks off and she goes to turn it. She decides that this is the next person that she's going to make want war, right? Because now Amata the queen wants war. So she's turned against her husband. And now we're gonna make Turnus want war against yeah, everybody. So she goes to Saturnus and she takes on the form of an old woman. She basically says to Saturnus in this form, are you not upset? All of your energies are now going to waste. That everything that you have built up to in this moment that you wanting to marry Lavinia, you wanting to be king, you wanting to take over, that it's all in vain now. That none of it even matters because there's this rando fucking guy that's shown up and he's gonna take your place. Does that not bother you at all? I bet it does, Turnus. And you know what you should do to alleviate this struggle, to alleviate this pain of yours? You should go and fight them because if you get rid of them, then you know they will never be a threat again. And people will know that you've done this and no other foreigners will come. You are so welcome. She actually ends this by saying a very ominous thing, which I did write down in my notes, but I kind of wanted to end that as a jerky way as I was saying it. Anyway, so the very ominous thing that uh, that she does say is she says, if King Latinus does not agree to obey the commands and allow you this marriage, he must learn he must, in the end, face Turnus with his armor on. That was definitely a much better way of ending that. I just got too caught up in like the jokey voice of Electo as this old lady. But that is ominous and that is how she ends the speech. And Turnus replies, not in the way that she wants to. Turnus literally laughs at Electo's face, uh, which you know is not gonna go well, but he laughs at her and he's like, yeah, of course I've heard the fucking rumors. Like who hasn't heard the rumors of these foreign people showing up? Don't worry, like Juno hasn't completely abandoned us. It's fine. You have all these false fears that they're actually threats just because you're old and you're aged. And so now you worry in your old age and you want to control things. And don't worry, little old lady, it's fine. My place is solidified. Honestly, it's chill. Electo being a goddess, being a fury, fucking hates this response. In fact, she flares up so quickly to the point where as you're reading it, you're like, wow, that is zero to a hundred. I thought Juno was mad. You've seen nothing yet until you read this description of Electo firing up at Turnus. She goes, oh, oh, am I just old? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just old. So I have false fears of shit that's going to happen, of shit that I know is going to happen. If I'm so old, Turnus, look at this. She shows herself off as a fury. Um, which is a lot for a human. And then because Turnus is sleeping, did I mention that he's asleep? Well, it's the middle of the night, he's asleep when all of this is happening. I, I don't remember if I said that in the beginning, but he is asleep. And so in the dream, she transforms into a fury and then Turnus is terrified and asleep, like he starts sweating and all this. And then she throws a burning torch at him. I mean, whatever's gonna make you feel better, but at the same time, it's a little much, even for a dream. The torch though lodges deep in Turnus's heart and that is when he wakes up and he is like, totally sweating, he's fucking terrified, and he's like, okay, this is serious. Turnus then goes to rally up all of his men. He rallies all of them up and he tells them that the plan is that they're all going to be defending Italy and so that he's going to send some people to Latinus because he believes that they should all protect themselves against the Trojans, against these invaders. And everybody obviously that he's telling, they do the classic Homeric thing, even though this is Virgil, do the classic Homeric thing where they cheer and they're like, yes, Turnus, let's fight him. Turnus makes it very clear though that he's going to cast out any of the enemies, even if they are people who are on the Trojan side, who are Latin. So when they go to Latinus, he's not very much saying we're gonna protect Latinus, he's saying we are going to protect Italians. And if Latinus chooses to fight on the other side, he chooses to fight on the other side. That is what he's going to do. So it's a very ominous moment, but again, Electo's really happy because she knows that, you know, Turnus is not only ready for war against the Trojans, but also he's willing to fight any of the fucking Latins who are going to uh, go against him. So Electo, very happy. She's like, tick, tick, we got a Martin, we got Turnus. Who else isn't mad yet? The Trojans. Let's go over there. This is a very famous scene where I'm going to summarize the absolute bejesus out of it. And basically what happens is that she goes to the Trojans where 
Eula, so Iscarius, uh, Aeneas' son, is now sort of running around and he is hunting in the forest. Now there's this very famous deer. Um, there's a very the whole backstory to this deer about how it basically is stag. Actually, not a deer because it is it has the antlers and everything. Anyways, there's a very famous stag, and the stag has like domesticated itself to this one family. The whole village knows the stag. They're all really good friends with it, so no one hunts stag, right? So like they know who the stag is. They all feed the stag and all of this. It's really cute. It's kind of like this little communal pet. Except one day, unfortunately, when Ascanius is out, um, that the goddess Electo gets involved and makes Ascanius shoot this particular stag. The stag is shot right in the belly, like this is a kill shot to this little poor stag, and the stag hobbles back over to the country people and is wailing and all of this, and everyone comes out of their houses to see this stag collapse. And so everybody then starts shouting for each other so that everybody can come and see the stag, and that they know that it's dead, the stag that they love, and this like, as I said, like communal pet for all of them. And they all get really mad because Electo is lurking in the forest and is watching this and making sure that everybody gets really mad. And they get really mad, they take up all their arms and they decide that they're going to fight whoever it is that killed the stag, which is the Trojans. So they all come out, they're all ready to attack and they want to go and attack Ascanius who has like his hunting dogs who helped with the whole stag thing. And so he comes out and they all want to fight Ascanius, which then what Electo does is Electo goes to tell the Trojans in a very weird way that Electo actually goes to sit on the top of a barn and then lets out this cry so that the Trojans know that something is wrong. The Trojans come out of their now, you know, camp building site thing or whatever. They come out of that to go and help Ascanius. And there's these two lines now of battle that's happening, right? This is like totally random and in the moment. The Trojans are now ready for it. The people are now ready for it. And everybody is just lusting for blood. It happens very quickly with Electo. Suddenly as they're all standing there and they're just facing off it, there's the hiss of an arrow and the arrow hits one of the guys in the front and he falls over and he dies immediately. And that is when the war starts. So Electo sees that happen. Electo's like, great, job's done, and she goes back to Hera to relay the good news. She says, look at me, I did such a good job. Look at them all ready to fight. If you want any more of this from me, you know where to find me. I'm more than happy to be of service. Juno replies, thank you very much for your service, but actually if there's anything more that I need to get done, I will make sure to get it done by myself. You've done what I couldn't do, which is just set all of this up. So cheers for that. And if I, again, if I need to do anything, I will be handling it so you don't have to worry. You can go home and relax. So now, Everyone is mad, okay? And Latinus starts realizing that there's fights going on here, there, and everywhere, that everybody's kind of ready to fight with each other. It's kind of madness, starting with Amata and ending with this whole stag death thing, right? It's, it's complete mayhem at this point, no thanks to the gods. And Latinus can't understand how this happened and why this happened, because literally a day ago, everything was fine. So he calls up to the gods and he questions why this is happening. He has no idea. And he actually says in this prayer that he says that Turnus is the guilty one. He says that you will receive a punishment, Turnus, because you have started all these problems. In fact, Latinus is so hurt by seeing all of his people fight that he actually goes to his home and he hides away, that he shuts himself away in his house and he doesn't want to have anything to do with this battle because as he said to the gods, he had already established calm waters, is pretty much the phrase that he used. That he used this whole analogy of ship faring and all of this, where he says that he had calmed the waters, he had sorted everything out, everything was fine. And then it's Turnus, you know, coming up. It had nothing to do with Amata, apparently. It had nothing to do with the fact that, you know, he's marrying Lavinia off to a stranger. And Amata clearly fancies Turnus and wants to marry him himself, but can't, so wants to live vicariously through her daughter. But, you know, like, that's not even allowed to happen. All of these things is blamed on Turnus, according to Latinus. And so when he shuts himself away, he doesn't want anything to do with it. So the end of the book, after Latinus locks himself away, is that we go through, uh, basically, a catalog of the heroes of the Latins, who are going to be fighting against the Trojans. So we get a very long list of the people, where they come from. It's supposed to mirror the catalogue of ships from the Iliad, okay? So we get a nice long list of who everybody is, where they're from, all of their warriors, what kind of warriors that they were, um, all of these great men. But the greatest of all of them, obviously, that Virgil really harps on is Turnus. He is the best of the best. We get a description of his armor. We get a description of his fighting history. Like, this guy is a force to be reckoned with. He's super hot. I'm not gonna lie to you guys. Um, when I'm reading this, like constantly, even now when I read it for the first time when I was 17, I was like, this man's hot. Now I'm still like, this man's super hot. And because it's my channel, I feel like I can tell you guys that. His description does him a lot of justice, right? Like he is presented really, really well in this book. And that is the larger like back chunk uh, right at the end that we get um, of, of the description of the Latins. But the last, the last Latin who is mentioned, who is harped on as being a terrible force to be reckoned with and someone who's going to be fighting alongside them that the Trojans should be terrified of is Camilla. Camilla is a warrior princess and uh, we will meet her later on. She has a, well, 
She has like 400 lines where she lives and, and she fights and that's all we get of her. But she's harped on in the last part. So she comes after Turnus and Camilla, they're like, fucking hell, they got Camilla on their side. Who's gonna come through? These are her weapons and this is who she is. And she's terrifying and she's bringing all these people. And, and I love that we end with a woman being this great warrior princess character. I don't know why no one talks about Camilla enough. Her death is a little bit stupid when we come to it. Sorry, spoiler alert. When we come to it, it's a bit dumb. But aside from that, I love that we end the book with her coming after Turnus. Turnus is the best of the best, but then there's Camilla. But that is the end of this book. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to book seven of the Aeneid Hero Moaning. We are now in the latter part of the book. It is all war pretty much from here. Um, that is really all we get. I'm trying to think of like one thing that isn't war. Um, it's all centered around this war and about Aeneas having to overcome the Latins in order to rule over Latium uh, and marry Lavinia. So thank you guys so much for tuning into this video. We'll be seeing you next time with more drama here on the channel. So I'll be seeing you then.